is the Tamron 17-70mm f2.8 for the Sony a6000 series, the most versatile zoom lens in the realms of APS-C crop sensor cameras. And that's because there really hasn't been a native E-mount lens with this range at this aperture or at this aperture with this range. The closest we ever come to was the Sony 16-55 f2.8 G lens, which was released back in 2019, but this lens got that one beat by 15 millimeters on the long end, and it has in-lens stabilization. Now, by no means is the 16 to 55 millimeter having a Terra bow range. In fact, it's terrific. If we really think about it, this is a full frame equivalent to a 24 to 82 and a half millimeter lens. And that lens kind of does exist on the full frame world known as the 24 to 70 millimeters. And this is considered an incredibly versatile mid-range zoom lens. Just ask any pros. However, Tamron is coming in with this 25 and a half to 105 millimeter full frame lens equivalent at f2.8. Just let that sink in. That is an insane amount of range. Now, don't worry if you don't understand the whole full frame crop sensor multiplication jargon that we had just now. Just know that this is the best range in its class with a constant aperture of f2.8. So what is this lens good for? Really anything when we consider this as a mid-range zoom lens. Landscapes, street, portraits, food, travel, weddings, video, you name it. It can be the ultimate one and done lens for some people out there. I took this lens to Zion and Bryce National Park at the tail end of 2020, and I had an incredible time with it just because of the amount of flexibility that I have with this lens. All right, so let's start off with image quality. It's sharp crisp, lots of details. Zooming into these rock formations, you see the lines, you see the textures, the char that looked like barbecued meat on a hot summer day. Contrast that with some white powdery snow that looks like frosted mini wheat cereals that I actually never really had as a kid because I'm all about the Fruit Loops. But check out that, even the tiny foliage of the trees out there. Crazy, crazy amount of details. Even at f2.8, we're seeing those nice, rich textures. Combine the f2.8 with the telephoto ranges of this lens and human eye autofocus, oh, portrait perfection. If you're looking for blurry background portrait photos, this is the key right here. At 35, 50, or 70 millimeter, you get the right amount of blur to center the attention of your subject. But what about them balls? Of course, I'm talking about the bokeh balls. The round shapes ain't bad. I'd say it's pretty similar to the 16 to 55 G lens. Both do have nine rounded diaphragm blades to make them pleasing ball shapes. But inside of those balls, it's looking a little rougher on the Tamron shot. And it's much more noticeable on the 70 millimeter shot, even without zooming in. Now, while I have seen smoother balls, in all honesty, this wouldn't be a deal breaker for me. But let me know in the comments down below if it is for you. I don't know how Tamron does it, but in almost all of their lenses for Sony, they are killing it with the extreme close focusing distance. Just look at how close I can get to my Link Nendoroid at 17 millimeter. Given the same distance, the 16 to 55 at 16 millimeter couldn't pull it off. I had to pull back further just to get it in focus at 16 millimeter. Because of this, I could see this advantage here with the Tamron to be a off the cuff macro lens if you're caught in a pinch. All right, so let's go ahead and move on and really take a look at the lens. Let's talk about the form factor. There's no physical autofocus, manual focus toggle on the lens itself. So you will need to have that handy in the function menu or one of your custom buttons if you frequently need to lock down focus. Not gonna be news for some folks who shoot with a lot of Sony APS-C lenses, especially a lot of the older ones. They generally don't have this physical toggle. Now I've said this before for full frame Tamron lenses, and I'm gonna go ahead and say it for this APS-C lens as well. The zoom ring and the focus ring are flipped. Uh, personally, it throws me off because I'm so used to it being the other way around, like this 16 to 55 right here. The zoom is on the back and the focus ring here is on the front. And I have accidentally messed with my focus before when I really wanted to zoom or when I really wanted to zoom, but accidentally messed with my focus. For example, some of these astro shots that I took right here, when I really wanted to just make sure I nail my focus, I would accidentally zoom or when I want to get uh, a little closer to the mountains, I <laughs> would accidentally mess with the focus. 
To be honest, it's not going to be a huge deal if this is a lens that you're investing in. You're likely going to get used to it and not make that mistake. But I figure I pointed out anyways just because this is a user experience review and that was my personal user experience. Now, with this amount of range at this aperture, there's going to be a little heft to it. You're going to feel that front drag. You're going to have to use two hands to support the setup, which is not a bad thing, especially for handheld videos. But as we've mentioned at the beginning of the video, this lens does have in-lens stabilization or what Tamron dubs it. VC vibration control. This is a great thing to have for A6000 series users who don't have built-in camera stabilization. So folks who use A6000, A6100, and A6400. Period. A6500 and A6600 users have in-body image stabilization and the vibration control of this lens will complement it. Now, I personally opted to test this lens out with the A6400 just because, again, it doesn't have any type of in-body image stabilization. And it was a joy to not have to worry about shaky handheld video footage when I was using it with the Tamron lens. I remember shooting with the 16 to 55 with the A6100. Neither of those setup have any type of stabilization. And man, was that handheld video footage shaky. So if you shoot a lot of videos and you have a camera with no in-body image stabilization, get this Tamron lens. And this entire setup right here, I would deem it as light. It's not compact anymore in the realms of APS-C setups, but it's still light enough to balance on a gimbal. I had it on the brand new DJI Ronin SC2 and it balanced pretty easy. I shot out of the roof of the car. I'm fighting against the wind, but the IBIS and the vibration control and the gimbal really helped getting some of these smooth road shots. Moving on to my famous video autofocus test. <laughs> Ouch. Don't worry, folks, Vivian's okay. What a champ she got back on that segue just to finish up the autofocus test for you guys. I think this video deserves a like for her tenacity. Anyway, starting off with a difficult tracking forward and backwards test. Both lenses, surprisingly, the background, the building in the back, was pulsing pretty hard as she was going backwards. But as far as I can tell, Vivian herself remained relatively in focus the whole time. Now, when Vivian was riding forward, the Sony did a much better job handling that background focus posing we saw earlier than the Tamron. The Tamron was suffering the same issue. Still though, both did a great job keeping her in focus as she rode towards the camera. As for grabbing focus, Tamron is snappy, which is a good thing. Immediately nailed focus right on me when I popped into frame. Though, I do have to say, the rack focus looked to be a bit smoother with the Sony when it was achieving focus to the background. In terms of video autofocus motor noise, it's silent for the most part. But if you held the setup up and pressed your ear on the lens, then yes, you can kind of hear the faint critter sound. But don't worry, if you have a mic on top of the hot shoe, it wouldn't be able to pick it up, and you'll be able to hear that for yourself in the following segment. Now, moving on to vlogging. Here's what I had to say. So 17 may not be wide enough for vlogging, but if you just grab it at the tip of the lens, you can extend it out a little bit further and get this beautiful view while you're gripping the edge, the tip of the lens and vlog at the same time. 17 millimeter, folks, grip the tip. <laughs> I just wanna conclude this section by saying it is completely doable vlogging with this lens, but just in contrast and comparison, here's what it would look like using a proper ultra wide angle lens to vlog with. Wow, look at the view, super gorgeous. I was, I was talking about the landscape, not you. <laughs> Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about price. $800. I've seen in a few Facebook groups by several people saying it's kind of expensive for an APS-C lens, and I kind of get where they're coming from. The full frame Tamron 20 to 75 millimeter f2.8 is also $800. However, there are several things to consider here. 
APS-C ecosystem as a whole is generally less expensive than the full frame ecosystem if we consider the latest and greatest. Bodies alone can be a thousand plus dollar difference. For example, the Sony a6400 with this lens, the total would cost you $1,700. The a7C, the brand new full frame compact mirrorless camera, alone, body alone, is $1,800 with no lens. $2,600 if you combine it with a full frame Tamron lens. Now, this is in the scenario of buying everything new. There are, of course, other cost-saving variables like waiting for a sale, buying an older model, or buying the setup used. But I'm just trying to illustrate a point here in the price and cost difference between APS-C and full frame. And let's be real here. Most people who are watching this video who are considering this lens already has an APS-C body. They may not have that bigger pool of budget to move on to full frame. So something like spending $800 for this lens versus $2,000 plus for a full frame setup, going for an $800 lens just seems a lot more cost efficient. Now, the other thing to consider, the closest equivalent to this Tamron lens is the Sony 16 to 55 millimeter G lens, which is $1,400, $600 difference. It's more expensive with no lens stabilization. Even my favorite, the Zeiss 16 to 70 millimeter F4 with optical steady shot and lens stabilization is $1,000, $200 difference between that and the Tamron lens. Similar range, but the Zeiss one is F4. All of a sudden, Tamron doesn't seem that expensive in comparison. Now, why would someone wanna consider the Sony 16 to 55 when the Tamron's clearly got it beat with the longer range, the closer focusing distance, and vibration control? Well, I'll tell you, image quality. The G badge on the 16 to 55 millimeter wears, it wears it proudly. Sharpness wide across the board, it's got Tamron beat. Corner sharpness at F9, 16 to 55, more clear. Center sharpness at F2.8, 16 to 55, more defined. And there is significantly less vignetting on the wide end from the Sony in comparison to the Tamron when you pull up these images side by side. And you may not think one millimeter makes a whole lot of difference on the wide end, but on APS-C, it could be the difference of getting everything in the shot or getting some things cut off. Moving on to ghosting, something that your crush would do to you, and also this Tamron lens. The Sony handles it way better. Flares are a lot more controlled as well. Remember that Astro shot? That particular night, that moonlight was really aggressive. So aggressive that it left a mark on the Tamron shot. Pulling up the Sony shot side by side, it's not there. And that vignetting again, a lot more prominent on the Tamron. So if you're an image quality snob, that $600 difference for the Sony is well worth it, 100%. However, for plebs like me, we're not gonna be so fixated on some of these flaws. And to be completely honest, the only way that we would have been able to tell is if we watch and subscribe to Jason Vong's YouTube channel and see these comparisons right here. So if you enjoy the hard work that went into making this video, please give it a like and comment down below. And stick around for the sponsored message at the end because it really does help me produce more videos like this one. But otherwise, I highly, highly recommend the Tamron 17 to 70 millimeter F2.8. It's at a great price. It has the most versatile range with a constant aperture of F2.8. It's got lens stabilization. Really, it hits a lot of the marks that most people are looking for in a zoom lens. As someone who shot with the famous full frame Tamron lenses, seeing this exist in the APS-C world brings me a lot of joy. It helps keep the APS-C ecosystem alive for another decade, and it will help bring more people into the mirrorless world affordably. Vivian and I always strive to bring you guys the best and most unique image and video samples whenever we talk about cameras and lenses. And oftentimes we have high production costs to make this all happen. It's sponsors like Squarespace that help fund our production budget so we can keep bringing you guys more high quality samples. So the best way to support us and to help us continue to do what we do is to simply check out how Squarespace can help you. Link down below. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to create beautiful websites. No coding knowledge whatsoever. Perfect for people like me because I just wanna make YouTube videos for you guys and not have to worry about coding my entire website. Simply just select one of their templates to get started. 
every aspect is easily customizable with their drag and drop feature. Whether you're in need of a portfolio, an e-commerce store, or even a simple blog, design it with Squarespace. Use my link down below to test it out. And when you're ready to launch your first website or domain, use my code Jason Vong to save 10% off. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.